Hi everyone and welcome to this presentation. My name is Katie Reese. I am here today to provide an overview of how we approach pediatric acute mechanical ventilation. I am a respiratory therapist and clinical educator for respiratory care in the critical care unit at SickKids. Uh, this presentation is really intended for individuals with some knowledge of mechanical ventilation who wish to expand their understanding to pediatric considerations. So we'll give you a few seconds to read this disclosure. I'd like to disclose also that I have no conflicts of interest and that any pictures of equipment or ventilators are examples only and not of an endorsement for their use in pediatrics. So the objectives for this presentation are to first discuss equipment considerations when it comes to ventilating the pediatric range of size of patients that we may see. And after that, we will quickly discuss the basic ventilation initiation and things that we consider. And finally, I'd like to present a few simple cases to apply some of the discussion that we have earlier in the presentation. So let's get started with the equipment. So the starting point for a lot of this presentation is really to take some time to familiarize yourself with the necessary equipment and options you have within your facility for providing pediatric mechanical ventilation. Most ventilators nowadays have multiple patient categories and each will have a unique weight or tidal volume range for the specific patient categories that are available on the device. So answering questions about how to set up the ventilator really depends on the device in use, and we would recommend that you consult your manuals or your clinical care specialist for these pieces of equipment. And while it's specific to the ventilator, there are some consistent generalizations that I think is important to consider for all patients. So first, when you are starting to ventilate a pediatric patient, you have to think about the circuit size. And you'll have to think about at what weight you might have to transition between this. And this may also influence whether you need to use a flow sensor with the ventilator as well. It also sometimes influences what type of valve or expiratory cassette or whatever piece of equipment that goes in that matches um, the patient category that's in use. And finally, uh, it's important to recognize what are the different software features on the equipment in use. So for example, leak compensation on ventilators may influence how you interpret uh, tidal volumes or uh, mechanical ventilation assessment. So I do wanna point out one thing about circuits. On occasion, we get, get asked what size of circuit we use in pediatrics. And again, we really follow device manufacturer recommendations for what size of patient that we would use on different uh, circuit types. So there is not, generally speaking, a pediatric size circuit. So we use both neonatal circuits for our smaller patients and adult size circuits for our older patients. Um, they do have different compliance ranges in terms of how much volume sometimes is lost to the circuit and this actually becomes really important you will want to have circuit compliance compensation on for the measurement of tidal volumes if you are not using a flow sensor so if you consider the examples here of a five kilogram infant on a pressure control of 15 at a circuit compliance of one mil per centimeter water, which would be what we have for that size of patient. This means approximately 15 mils is lost to the circuit, which if you're trying to do a calculation of your tidal volume mils per kilo, um, whether you have compliance compensation on or off will drastically impact your assessment of the tidal volumes. This is, becomes a little less important if you are directly using a flow sensor and measuring the absolute volumes at the patient ETT. So again, this may depend on the ventilator that is in use. So other equipment that we always use with invasive mechanical ventilation, the first one is humidity. We specifically choose to only use active humidity for the ventilation of all pediatric patients in our ICU. We generally consider this very important for our smallest patients to always maintain adequate humidity and secretion water balance. We also routinely use end tidal CO2 um, for the assessment and ongoing monitoring of all of our mechanically ventilated patients. 
which serves a few different benefits. Um, first, it always confirms that your airway is in situ if you have ongoing end tidal measurement, uh, but it also helps us trend ventilation and changes, eliminating some of the need for repeat blood work. In all cases, it's also really important to consider the cumulative effects, but that's a mouthful, of end tidal and flow sensors, as well as if you are using an HME, what this can potentially have on the patient. Um, so in generally, general, we don't have a lot of dead space in our circuits because we go to active humidity. Um, but if you are, you are using an HME, this can add a significant amount of dead space for our smallest patients when you're mechanically ventilating. Finally, in terms of equipment, you have to think about your airway and keep this as part of your troubleshooting or considerations when you're encountering difficulties in ventilation. In small children, it can be very easy to insert the ETT too deep or right main stem during high stress intubations or while you're securing the ETT. So please be mindful to assess really closely the depth. And similarly, you can also have a lot of difficulties with ventilation if you select or pre-select a very small ETT during the intubation process. Some needle needle software may compensate for small leaks and this might be an option um, for infants if you choose to go with an uncuffed ETT and there is a bit of a leak during ventilation. But if your tube is ultimately too small and uncuffed and large leaks, you will have a very difficult time ventilating and there may be considerations to consider switching your ETT. And this is just a quick reminder that uh, the 2020 Heart and Stroke Advanced Life Support Guidelines now formally recommend um, that there is a option to use a cuffed ETT in pediatrics. And generally, um, the cuff can be inflated using either a minimum occlusion volume technique or using cuff manometry to monitor the pressures to ensure a degree of safety uh, that the pressure from the cuff is not going to injure the airway. So this brings us to the second part of our presentation, which is mechanical ventilation settings. So when thinking about mode selection in mechanical ventilation, a lot of this may be culture-based and, and a preference towards a certain style of mechanical ventilation in your unit. At SickKids, we predominantly use a pressure-based ventilation strategy, and this is really culture, not necessarily evidence-based. And I will say that you can probably adapt your most common strategy for mechanical ventilation to pediatrics, and this may be the most appropriate way to assess ventilation if you are doing this infrequently at your institution. I will say there are a few conditions where we have a preference to select certain modes of ventilation. So the one would be for any sort of neurological concern um, for a raised ICP or uh, neurological concerns in general. We typically go with a volume uh, targeted ventilation strategy, either pressure regulated volume control or straight volume control to provide a consistent minute ventilation and ideally a more consistent CO2 uh, with mechanical ventilation. For asthmatics in particular, we go with a volume targeted uh, ventilation mode so we can monitor uh, plateau pressures and avoid over distension if the patient's uh, resistance were to suddenly change. In the presence of a large leak, mostly you will be limited to using pressure-based ventilation and looking for appropriate chest rise, appreciating that tidal volumes will not be particularly accurate on most ventilators in pediatric kind of patient categories. And finally, if the patient is awake and spontaneously breathing and doing okay, it's totally appropriate to leave a patient on pressure support ventilation as tolerated so long as their worker breathing isn't significant. So if we get into specifics of mechanical ventilation settings now, all modes will have a PEEP level. And generally, the strategies for PEEP setting and titration follow the very same principles that you might encounter in both neonatal and adult, meaning that the purpose of PEEP is really to recruit the lung and maintain an optimal FRC for the patient. So do not be hesitant to use a PEEP of eight or potentially even 10 to support lung recruitment in the setting of a chest chest x-ray that demonstrates opacities and collapse that is consistent with atelectasis. I would generally assess PEEP tolerance patient by patient and ensure that we are not over distending. 
Generally, however, what we do find is that the PEEP FiO2 scale um, that you may be used to seeing in adults tends to be more condensed in younger sizes. And we tend to see over distension at uh, sometimes PEEP levels that may be what would be acceptable in adults or typical in adults. And in general, I would say, think about your principles and pathophysiology, uh, how you adjust PEEP. And if you think a bit more PEEP is needed to reduce atelectasis or maintain FRC, um, you should consider trialing that and seeing if it improves your FiO2, uh, your SATs, or your gas exchange on a blood gas. In terms of tidal volume, this may differ from your usual practice, just in terms of the range of tidal volume that you may actually have to set on your ventilator. So we typically target a mils per kilo, and we typically start with six to eight mils as a target for ventilation. And this would be based on either an ideal body weight, if you have a tall patient, um, that is typically a calculation done by length of patient. You can also use a Braslow tape for length of the patient to give you an estimated weight uh, for that length. Or you might even use an absolute weight if there is not obvious obesity that needs to be factored into your calculation. So kids grow really at different rates for age, and likewise, lung capacity varies with growth, and you should individualize your tidal volume to the patient's size that's presenting in front of you, not to a specific uh, range for a, an age category necessarily. So depending if you're setting this or uh, you're targeting this, um, you might move to a lung protective strategy as you kind of reach limits of mechanical ventilation of safety. And increasingly, there is a bit of attention to driving pressure in pediatrics and trying to limit this to 15 centimeters of water for lung protection, or looking at a plateau pressure of less than 28 centimeters of water more classically. So both of these things can be uh, considered. If you are targeting a tidal volume of six to eight mils based on pressure control, just know that your pressure control level sometimes may be slightly above 15, um, but if you're trying to estimate the driving pressure, you would then do a hold to get a zero flow state and a true driving pressure that's applied to the alveoli. So if you are using a pressure targeted ventilation mode, um, the range of tidal volume that you target or how you set your pressure control will be the same as if you were using a volume targeted mode. So it is totally reasonable to start your pressure control anywhere from 10 to 15. Um, what you choose to start may be dependent on the pathophysiology that presents in front of you. And you would then look for chest rise initially and then evaluate your tidal volumes that you've achieved on your ventilator. So just be mindful of uh, patient changes and in particular changes to sedation that have can have impacts on your tidal volumes that are delivered by the ventilator. And when pressure control level starts to exceed 15, you might consider moving to that lower range of four to six mils per kilo. The two parameters that really change specific to age ranges is going to be the respiratory rate that you choose to set as well as your inspiratory time. Um, so I've given a small chart here um, that you can pause the video and take a screenshot or create your own reference. And these are generally ranges uh, for most patients, not to say that there can't be a patient that falls outside of these criteria, but to give you a baseline of where the majority of our patients fall, um, these would be general settings that we think about. You can also see that there is a lot of overlapping ranges between patient age categories. And I'm sure you can appreciate that it's nearly impossible to memorize all of these different ranges. So a lot of even our respiratory therapists at SickKids um, or some of our fellows even carry around a little reference chart um, that has the ranges and resource cards to help with clinical care. So this can be something you consider doing for your own practice uh, to make sure that you have something uh, to reference. Another way to think about the inspiratory time and respiratory rate setting is to really kind of think of the two broad ends of the categories of the patients that we are managing. So if you think about a neonate who typically would start with an inspiratory time of 0.35 or 4, 0.4 seconds, um, and maybe a respiratory rate set at 40 beats per minute at kind of the maximum end, and it, then from the opposite end, a teenager who is fully grown um, with settings that generally resemble more adult-like settings, uh, you can basically think of children falling in the middle. And if you're dealing with a toddler, this is 
probably going to be more on the neonatal end or closer to those range of settings, or you have a eight or 10 year old that may be closer to that adolescent style of setting that is on the screen. So if you have to think about stuff broadly or like to think about stuff broadly, your inspiratory time is going to fall between these two spectrums of settings. So the final aspect that's worth mentioning in terms of individualizing your assessment is that your waves forms can be very helpful, in particular with setting your inspiratory time. So this assumes a decelerating flow pattern um, style of mechanical ventilation, meaning pressure control or uh, PRVC. And really what you can see uh, on this flow time scale is that setting a different inspiratory time will ultimately produce different results. So if you set your inspiratory time where your flow almost achieves near zero, you can see that you have lots of area under the curve. This is going to represent your tidal volume. If you shorten your eye time too much or have a too short of an eye time set, um, you will need a higher inspiratory pressure to give the same tidal volume um, because you've lost this area now under the curve. Lastly, if you set a tidal volume that's too long, uh, you'll have an inspiratory hold at the end of your breath. And really all this produces is asynchrony and a potential for gas trapping if you turn up your respiratory rate. So, other settings on your mechanical ventilator generally match what you would set in other populations, meaning in terms of uh, trigger, we would generally use flow triggering and keep it in the most sensitive or a generally sensitive range uh, for the patient. In terms of rise time, we generally leave the set at 0.15 seconds or 0.1 second unless there's significant distress where we may shorten this. Um, and in terms of cycling on pressure support, it generally is set somewhere between 10 and 30. Uh, this assumes no leak. Um, generally, just remember that small neonates may have a short time constant, so flow drops relatively quickly. And that's when we may choose a lower cycling, meaning 10%, um, to allow a little bit more inspiratory time while on pressure support um, to avoid someone getting too tachypneic. So I'm doing a presentation about mechanical ventilation, but I have not yet talked about blood gas ranges. And this is somewhat purposeful because there may be a wide range of gases that present in front of you. But generally speaking, in pediatrics, if you have respiratory disease, it is okay and acceptable um, to allow for permissive hypercapnia. And this is generally tolerated well by most pediatric patients. Um, there's always going to be a discussion about the benefit of turning up the ventilator and the potential for ventilator-induced lung injury versus accepting okay blood gases. Um, there might be also cases where there is a need to target normal blood gases in pediatrics because of a traumatic brain injury with elevated ICP, for example. Um, but the one thing I would say is it can be very uh, common to try to target a normal blood gas or think you should be doing that and always just have that nugget in your head if turning up your ventilator is the right choice in this situation. So we've now arrived at the cases, and I'd like to give you a few examples of how we would assess or review ventilation in two um, specific cases that I've built. So if you have a moment, I would like you to pause your video and grab a pen and paper to write down your assessment to get the most out of the two cases. So I'm going to start with an infant case, a four-month-old, five-kilogram infant who is suspected to have bronchiolitis. And on arrival to the emergency department, they are apneic and hypoxic. And despite optimizing therapies, the patient quickly progresses to requiring intubation and is now intubated with a three and a half ETT, is sedated and not moving. So you have an I-STAT or a capillary blood gas that's been done. And the following readings are 7.23 for a pH, a CO2 of 62, a bicarb of 23 and a base excess of minus 2. You have an end title that's actually reading 54 millimeters of mercury and a SAT of 98. So you currently are ventilating in pressure control. I would like you to look at the ventilator screen here. This may not be the ventilator that you are used to using, um, but you, are, you can see that your ventilation settings are actually all across the bottom down here and you are currently ventilating in pressure control here. And you have this range for a peak pressure um, up here, and you have tidal volumes and a minute volume over here.
So I'm going to give you a few seconds to look at this and think about what you might do with this blood gas. So I'm going to advance to the next slide. If you need a few more moments, um, just pause this video and have a look. So there are a few things that I think about this case. One, you have an okay blood gas. Not great, but also not the worst blood gas that I've seen in the, in the world. Um, you're ventilating on acceptable ventilation pressures and respiratory rate and settings, and you have a PEEP of five with an FO2 of, of 45, which again is okay. Um, and so really when I think about this case, I think you're okay but not optimized and I would maybe try increasing my respiratory rate to 28 to 30. It doesn't look like I have any gas trapping on these waveforms. Um, your tidal volume is slightly on the low end but your pressure control is 14. That's kind of nearing the upper limits but you've got loads of room to move on your peak pressure. Um, so you also might consider increasing or weaning your FiO2 to see if you actually need 45%. You have a SAT of 98. Um, and if you really can't get below, too far below 40% um, on this, you might even try a little bit more PEEP for this um, patient to see if you can um, potentially wean your FiO2 further. So I'm going to talk through a second case, and this is a 15-month-old, 11-kilo patient who's been unwell for two days, is not eating with a fever, and has had seizures, and is obtunded on arrival. So the patient is intubated. Following intubation, the SATs are 89, the end title is 44 millimeters of mercury, and you don't actually have any sort of blood gas to look at. Uh, you don't have an x-ray, and you have a four and a half cuffed ETT at 12 centimeters oral. Um, and so I'd like you to think about this case, what seems acceptable or reasonably normal for this case, and maybe what would you do based on the information that you have in front of you at this moment. So again, I'm going to advance in a few seconds. If you need a few more moments, just pause the video here. So this is the case that you have in front of you, a 15-month-old, 11 kilo, um, who has a history of fevers and seizure, obtended on arrival with SATs of 89 and an end title of 44 millimeters of mercury. So when I look at the ventilator, a few different things I notice. One, I'm currently set at 80%, um, but I'm still not able to achieve my SATs of 80, or a, really a SAT of greater than 90. Um, and you have an acceptable, really kind of end tidal level. I'm going to presume that you have um, not a big gradient from your end tidal to your blood gas, um, but that might be something at play that you would have to um, just quantify at some point in your assessment. But if I had a CO2 of 44 on, a, on an end tidal, I might be inclined to assess that my mechanical ventilation or the ventilation aspect is at least okay at this moment. So I'm achieving actually seven mils per kilo, or I've set um, seven mils per kilo based on the tidal volume that I have set here with a peak pressure that is also acceptable. Um, and so I'm not unhappy with that, um, but I am unhappy with my oxygenation at this point. So if I truly am requiring 80%, um, I would probably definitely try a bit more PEEP in this circumstance to see if I can um, improve my oxygenation. Um, the other thing that I notice when I look at my waveform here is that you can see that your inspiratory time ends relatively early and you cycle into exhalation. So this might be a time where I would actually potentially increase my inspiratory time from 0.6 seconds maybe to 0.7 um, and that will probably in this type of mode PRVC decrease your peak pressure even further. Um, I do think that, again, this circumstance would be also part of your clinical assessment would be that um, you have good air entry bilaterally, um, that the patient doesn't need a suction and can't be improved with some uh, common interventions to improve oxygenation or at least troubleshoot that way. So in summary, 
you'll need to know in your clinical setting what equipment that you have available to provide pediatric mechanical ventilation. If you are not using a flow sensor in your equipment, you'll need to make sure that you have circuit compliance compensation activated to ensure accurate assessment of your tidal volumes. You also need to think about if ideally you could use end tidal or humidity or what the options are available at your institution. And you always need to factor in the assessment of your airway or your ETT and ensure that it's adequate to provide uh, mechanical ventilation. If you think about the settings on your mechanical ventilator, you'll need to know and use the modes that you are familiar with. We generally would uh, adopt a tidal volume strategy of six to eight mils per kilo and move towards lung protective strategies whenever you're reaching these limits, whether that tidal volume is set or targeted. It's always a good strategy to be lung protective in your mechanical ventilation. And respiratory rate and inspiratory time are going to be the two settings that you really need to think about for the different age ranges that you'll encounter in pediatrics. And finally, with these kind of tools in your belt and your other knowledge about pediatric mechanical ventilation, I hope that you've been able to apply some of these principles or think about some of the things that we have in terms of the cases that we presented today. I want to take the time to thank you for watching this recording. I hope it has been a helpful overview of pediatric mechanical ventilation. And please don't hesitate to reach out to Connected Care Inquiries at sickkids.ca if you have any more questions that you'd like answered.